here's here's the reason that there's never going to be an index fund bubble. So Ytrut sent us this data. They looked at just 2020 performance, and they broke it out by sector, and then they gave us the top five performing stocks in each sector. So, for instance, the best performing one, of course, was technology. It was up 44%. The top five performers were all up more than 400%. So Veritone, which I don't even know what they do, they're up 1,000%. The gains in these holdings are ridiculous. Every single sector has hundreds and hundreds of percentage points of gains, right? Healthcare was up even, 13%. Even real estate, which yeah. lost money last year. Every So energy was down 33%. The best performer, Whiting Petroleum, was up 240%. There's enormous gains in here. This is the reason why people become bored with index funds. And, they move, and, and even though I, I had it in here to talk about, Vanguard now has over $7 trillion and iShares is close to $8 trillion. So that stuff is still huge. But the returns that you can get in individual holdings, especially when people can trade for free, that that urge is just always going to be there. So index funds are never going to do this. So you see this this story last week of the Tiger King woman, Carol Baskin. She was on this Cameo service, and she said that Cameo paid her to pump up a stock, basically. This is Zometica, Z-O-M. It, does everyone just creating tickers that look like Zoom now, just in case? But it was up 230%, and it had a billion shares traded since she put this little 15-minute thing on Cameo. So someone paid her to do this, and it shot a penny stock up ridiculously. Are micro bubbles just with us um, forever? Because these traders. So last week there was a headline: a handful of penny stocks just made up a fifth of U.S. volume. That's insane, <laughs> that right? Is, that is. I wild. mean, that is insane. Uh, and so these people aren't leaving. the The thing that might end this, and forget about a you know. A, the bubble burst and where all of these stocks go to zero. Let's just assume that doesn't happen. They could crash 50, 60, but let's just assume that they don't all go down 80% like the dot-com bubble. What can reverse this trend is what if people just go back to work? Maybe, but I mean, you saw something like GameStop last week that was up 100% in a couple of days. And that was, people wanted to say that it was because of someone joining the new board, but it sounds to me like it was this Reddit community who just are doing these like attacks on this. And so they, like, squeeze, they squeeze the shorts. They're doing these coordinated attacks. And you don't want to believe me, but these people are getting smarter. And they're going to they're gonna get caught holding the bag at some point. But you're right. If they keep just going from pocket to pocket and then leaving, it's kind of like the JT Marlin office in uh, Boiler Room where they have all the, the phones and then they pick up all the desks and move them to the place next door. That's kind of what they're doing. They're ransacking now, these, these companies and they're leaving them. I changed my mind. By the way, that's kind of like, uh, remember Independence Day? How the aliens go from planet to planet, sucking their resources dry and then moving on? That's exactly what Wall Street Bets is doing. And I am I was laughing uh, maybe a few months ago when you said that. I'm not laughing anymore. I think that these people are getting smarter. They are getting more sophisticated. It doesn't mean they can't lose money. Um, and they found these small stocks where they know that they can have an impact. So what what stops this? Is it regulation? I don't know even what that means. Maybe you can't talk about penny stocks on Cameo, for example. That would be probably a good place to start. But this isn't going away. If you think that things are going back to the way they used to be, forget about it. Commissions going to zero was a watershed moment. We're never going back to 1992. Like It's just, it's not going to happen. So these micro bubbles, getting back to my point earlier, these micro bubbles, I think, might be a permanent part of the market going forward. It would be kind of crazy if even and, by the way, even if the broader market crashes, we could still see micro bubbles. Well, if, if well, won't they start shorting eventually? But if the if now, the now you're giving them now you're giving them a little bit too much credit. Yes, yeah, true. If, but if the pandemic caused this just wave of day traders to be here with us for a long time, that would be that'd be well. Of course, it can't stay forever. Again, people are going to lose money, but the, the the penny stock stuff that's just enormous. So sentiment trader tweeted. There was more, even before the spike in recent weeks, there was more than 1 trillion shares traded in penny stocks in December. How many minutes would that be? Isn't that your forte? You, you can break down trillions in a minutes for me. <laughs> well, okay. So, but, and it looks like before then it was 200 billion in, in the month preceding it. Oh, right, right, right. So five times higher than the month preceding it, which is another crazy extra net, like extreme we're seeing where micro caps have outperformed small caps and mid caps but then large caps have up it's it's a really weird market where we're seeing the two usually it's it's a teeter totter and right now it's both it's a barbell i just told this to josh uh, on the youtube channel micro cap stocks have doubled the performance of large cap stocks over the last year 32 versus 15 
How is that possible? Here's another one from Seth Trader. We didn't think traders could get any more speculative than they were at the end of August. We were wrong. For the first time, small trader call buying exceeded 9% of total New York Stock Exchange volume last week. People, this is madness. And I don't we, think people are ready for this to be with us for the foreseeable future. I think people are dismissing this as a speculative frenzy, which it is, but I don't think they're going to leave. You and I have been flagging this stuff for months and months now, and every once in a while, someone on Twitter and our email will send us something and go, okay, guys, really, seriously, this is the top, right? But we've been talking about these anecdotes for seven months, at least. Like, good luck figuring out which one of these is, okay, that it's, it's gone too far. You just you'll never be able to tell with this stuff. So so that's my. I don't think this is going away. I really don't. The journal did a piece about this frenzy. Video snippets under the tag hashtag Neo. So Neo is a Chinese electric car company. I think it's worth a hundred billion dollars and worth ha. Huh? But that's what its market cap is. Those videos have accumulated more than thirty five million views on TikTok. On Twitter, it was mentioned nearly 6,800 times on a single day in November, up from about 100 mentions a day at the start of 2020. NEO has been the second most actively traded stock in the U.S. over the past year, with 111 million shares trading hands each day. I bear, I don't even know who this company is. It's I, the I second I most heard heavily- I heard of it last week for the first time, I think. Um, option volume tied to NEO has surged with more than one-tenth of all activity recently stemming from individual investors. This is not going away. So if you're using this as a barometer for, you know, bearishness or whatever, throw it out. It's not relevant. Now, that being said, again, crazy shit is happening. There's no, there's no doubt about it. Kathy Wood announced that she's launching a space exploration ETF, and the market is smart. Virgin Galactic jumped 20% immediately. So they, the Wall Street Journal article you've referenced, they, they, they looked at the top 10 traded securities by average daily volume, and I think this was for... For the end of 2019 through January, so this is the first week of the year. The, the three times long crude ETN was up there. Um, I'll, I'll, Sundial Growers, which I've never heard of. And then you have your you know, General Electric and Ford. But you're seeing these big blue chip companies that would make sense to be there, along with these crazy ETFs in companies that you and I have never heard of. So uh, shifting from the small money to the gigantic money, there was a big story from Greg Zuckerman last week that James Simons is stepping down as chairman. I don't think he's run the funds for a long, long time now. Um, matter of fact, if you read that excellent book, it was basically um, uh, Robert Mercer and Peter Brown that were steering the ship. So, but anyway, did but he, Simon, did he but, announce that he's going to spend some more time with his cartons of cigarettes? Is that but, what he's doing? But, but Simons was, was still the chairman. He was the architect. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't the code breaker. Probably. He was, I think that was my favorite book of the last year. It was oh. excellent. So, all right, this this is tough. So the Medallion Fund, which is the probably, not probably, the best performing hedge fund of all time, and I think by such a wide margin that it's not even close. Um, so they returned all their capital to outside investors. When was that? Like, it was a long time oh, ago. Eight? I mean, yeah. a, a long time ago. Um, so they crushed it last year. They, had, they were up 76% in 2020. They gained 98% in 2000, 82% in 2008, and 76% last year. So when the markets got crushed, they just absolutely crushed it. On the other end, we've got the Renaissance Institutional Equity Fund fell between 20 and 30% last year. That's a tough look. And you know, whatever, whatever, say say what you want. The market, the S&P 500 was up 20%, was up almost 20% last year. I don't know how you could stay invested in a firm that does that. That is so bad for on the one end and so good for themselves. I don't know how you could you could justify that. That's a tough look. So I'm not saying that anything shady is going on, that they're you know purposefully disadvantaging. You know, I don't think I'm not saying that at all. But that's tough, right? It's it's just that their their secret sauce they figured out doesn't scale. Well, also they, they're, they're keeping it all for themselves. Their secret sauce, correct? It doesn't but why, scale. Why do they invest money? Why do they even take money? So they they have what is it, you said, fifteen billion dollars in medallion. Why don't they just invest money for themselves and not even take outside capital? Would you be shocked if they return all the capital? I mean, obviously they're they're still making money, but um, maybe and, they should. So the Medallion Fund is intraday. I forget what percentage of volume they were responsible for, but it was a big number. Not quite as big as the Wall Street Bets, uh, but it was a big number. And the Institutional Equity Fund, it's more long term in nature. It's not a trading strategy. So whatever it was doing did not work. Obviously, last year. So the story everyone sent us to talk about. 
that was probably one of the most widely ones I saw on Twitter was the guy who got locked out of his Bitcoin. My wife asked me about that. Yeah, I saw. My wife saw it on the Today Show too. I, 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 I tried briefly explaining it to her, and you, you called me and said, "How do we explain Bitcoin to my wife?" And I had no idea. Well, I fell back on the old John Oliver quote: "Bitcoin is everything I don't understand about money combined with everything I don't understand about computers." Is is Bitcoin one of the instances where? Like sometimes the simpler a topic is, the easier it is for people to understand. Is complexity actually its best selling point? The fact that it is almost impossible to explain, like in layman's terms, to someone who just has no idea what it is. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Anyway, so this guy in San Francisco, somehow the cryptography behind this is he has ten passwords to figure out to get his recover his Bitcoin off of his laptop from whatever year yep. he had it in. You ever and, see sword? You ever see Swordfish? Yes. Good movie, right? It was okay. No, it's my type of movie. Just okay. complete garbage yeah, action. Was, right. Yeah. Remember that scene where Hugh Jackman's got to crack the computer code? Right. That might. That was my thought. This could have been a '90s movie. <laughs> totally. I just need another minute. I need another minute. So he's got two passwords left, and I, I know some people were were, and he he's been thinking about it because it's worth 220 million dollars if he can crack this. And some, I guess, there were people on Twitter saying that they could bring it to a service because this is an old laptop and maybe someone could say, like, give me 10% of it and I'll crack the code for you somehow. I guess this is the double-edged sword of, of this, of having the security where it's easy to lose if you have it like this. But but this is why you and I never could have bought this in like 2011 when it's like, oh, it was trading at $3 and people could have become millionaires because we never would be able to figure out how to put this on our laptop or have what? the key to store it, right? No, dude, I can't remember any of my passwords. When did Coinbase even open? I honestly don't know. But so there's another one of this guy that this British guy who accidentally threw away a hard drive loaded with Bitcoin that is worth more than seventy million dollars, and he's trying to get his town to let him go look in the dump, in the garbage dump, to find his. He's trying to find a needle in the blockchain. Good luck. I would honestly going into a landfill. I think I would just let him let the landfill have that seventy million. I don't think it'd be worth it. I don't think you'd ever get that smell off of you. What would you rather have? Smell like a landfill the rest of your life or have $70 million in Bitcoin? Probably $70 million. That's just me. Uh, <laughs> pig pen. Okay. By the way, Bitcoin's at 38000 I think last week when we, last Monday was 30000 we were talking about it. Still remains the most fun thing on our screen. 